Our last speaker for the morning is Dr. Jim Blum, who's one of the anesthesiology critical care attendees at Emory, who will be running the ECMO program here at Emory. Thank you for uh, your time this morning. Um, this, uh, it's a privilege to be here to talk to you about mechanical circulatory support. Um, this first slide has nothing to do with Dr. Latou's presentation, I will say that. It has, uh, has to do with this presentation, um, in that this is a dynamic field. The data is changing on a regular basis. And I think that the numbers I'm going to give you today, I think, are reflective of the field as I perceive it. But I think it's important to understand that there are other perspectives out there. Uh, this is a list of disclosures, none of which have anything to do with uh, uh, ECMO uh, or extracorporeal support. And today, this is why I want to get through to you in the next uh, 13 minutes, I guess. So uh, we're going to cover the very fundamentals of mechanical circulatory support, look at indications for mechanical circulatory support, discuss briefly the complications that if you're considering it that you may be seeing, and then look at the outcomes when you consider this technology. This is not a lecture that is designed to tell you how to do mechanical circulatory support. It's a lecture to discuss when to consider it and when to perhaps not consider it. <clears throat> so what is mechanical circulatory support? This is a fundamental question. I would say that this is not a new technology. This is an old technology. It's 50 years old with the idea of using essentially this, intraortic balloon pumps to assess to assist people when they are going into severe cardiogenic shock. There is only one problem with this. For 50 years, we used this technology, and everyone said that this is the standard of care. We will never, ever, ever test it to, in, a, in a standardized fashion. And as Dr. Brower pointed out yesterday, this is a big flop for people that act, they actually did the study, right? The shock true trial demonstrated this does not improve outcomes in patients with myocardial infarction and severe cardiogenic shock. So the question is, what can we do to help improve their outcomes? And what I would say is that there's a lots of new technologies that are out there these days to support people in, when they need uh, mechanical surgery support. And we have this technology. It still exists, and I think there is a place for it. But we have a lot of other technologies that have come down the road in the last, particularly in the last 10 years. ECMO has been around for 40 years or so uh, in one form or the other. But these technologies have really made mechanical circulatory support a realistic technology for many places. The basics of mechanical circulatory support are as follows. This is an ECMO circuit. And what makes it an ECMO circuit is this thing, this membrane oxygenator that's up here. That's what ECMO stands for, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. But all mechanical circulatory support is based around essentially two things. One is a pump of some form and some way of getting blood in and out of the heart. Uh, that is essentially what mechanical circulatory support is. It is nothing more than that. And if you think about it that way, it's very straightforward. It is designed, and what we're going to talk about today is temporary mechanical circulatory support, is get people over a hump, whatever that hump may be. It is not designed as definitive therapy. It's not that we put, pe put people on an impella, we put them on some type of device, and they instantly get better, and we send them home most of the time. We are bridging them to somewhere. And frequently, we talk about bridging them to this, which is an implanted form of mechanical circulatory support, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about today, because this falls into the realm of cardiac surgery and really cardiology more so than it does in the realm of general critical care. The question is, how does mechanical circulatory support differ from cardiopulmonary bypass machines? And, and I would say that there's a few things that, that have really made this a possibility. The first of all is that these things have been designed for weeks of support, not for hours of support. That's basically done by frequently removing the oxygenator. In ECMO, we have that, but you can frequently remove the oxygenator that you usually see in, in CPB. And everything has been designed essentially to minimize blood trauma. CPB causes lots of hemolysis. It causes lots of consumption of coagulation factors. And this technology is designed to avoid that. They do that by essentially generating less turbulence. They, they essentially generate less clot. There is no venous reservoir, which basically is a big bucket okay, that uh, you keep blood in, which makes it great when you're doing surgery, when you can say, I need more blood, give me blood, I need less blood, put it in the bucket. This is not that solution. So if you have a bleeding patient or you have lots of volume shifts, mechanical circulatory support is not the solution to that problem. The other thing has been persistence. Really, that's what's made mechanical circulatory support successful is the fact that people have followed this for, and pursued this for the last 40 or 50 years. Um, it's been a dream. And, what, and as what we've seen is this. This is numbers from ECMO, essentially. But as you see, in the last uh, five years or so, 10 years, 
there's been a dramatic uptick in the use of ECMO. And if you see mechanical circulatory support, you'll see similar graphs to this. Um, and why is that? It's because everything has gotten better. And it's not any one thing that's gotten better, except for probably this, understanding. We understand who to use this technology on much better than we did probably even five, ten years ago. And I think that's the key thing. When you look at the small innovations that have happened, we've gone from having these roller pumps, which are what we used in the, in the OR for a long period of time, to these centrifugal pumps, some magnetically levitated pumps. This is a continuous reduction in the turbulence that we put on blood. When we use an oxygen air, we've gone from using this, which is a silicone membrane, which just tore blood up like crazy, to this substance that's in this thing, which is polymethylpentene, and made things much better. The other thing is that it used to be when you talk mechanical circulatory support, this is what you were talking about, VA ECMO. Essentially, blood was extracted in some way from the venous circulation, run through an oxygenator, and pumped back in through the arterial circulation, usually retrograde up the aorta. And this is what it looked like. So you were putting in these gigantic cannulas that were flowing into people. You can imagine that this was fraught with the potential complications. Or we were, if that wasn't enough, we would do something like this and you know, create even more complications. But today, the technology is much better. This is a picture from 10 years ago when I was in my residency. This is a picture of this, the technology today, this box. Everything that's on this cart except for this little machine is in this box uh, today. So um, it's, uh, it's been a true evolution in technology. And the technology has gotten even better. We've gone to things like this, the tandem heart, which essentially removes the oxygenator. An interventional uh, cardiologist punctures the intratrial septum and extracts oxygenated blood from the, right, from the left atrium, puts it through a little pump that stays on the patient's uh, thigh, and injects it retrograde up the aorta. Or this device, which is called the impella, which essentially sits through a very relatively small uh, catheter, a sheath, and runs directly into the aorta, across the aortic valve, and the pump is actually right here. That sits right here and extracts blood. And yet, this is now a technology that's available in a 3.5 liter a minute uh, configuration. So it's a great piece of technology. The, when you implement this technology, this is what you're getting on. You're getting on a bridge to somewhere, and this is what the bridge looks like. It's not a comfortable place to be. These patients are incredibly difficult to manage. They take a lot of time and resources from knowledgeable people. When should you consider this technology? I would say when you are thinking about doing this, which is the intraortic balloon pump, you should be considering some other form of, uh, of mechanical circulatory support because, as I showed you before, this is what the, the intraortic balloon pump does. I think in cases where you maybe have a patient that had a coronary, they aren't in that much shock. You're waiting to revascularize them. You want to improve their filling pressure, their diastolic filling of the cart. This technology still has a role. When you're, when you're someone in severe cardiogenic shock, that's probably not, not the right place. What do we define as severe cardiogenic shock? Well, if you look at patients that have mortality on IABPs, this is what you see. If after six hours they're on IABP and you have people with a high mean arterial pressure, a high CVP, they're on a bunch of epinephrine, their lactate is still greater than six. You can say, pick three of these things, almost 100% 100% mortality in this series that was published. Um, I think that that's a good place to start. This is another form of mechanical circulatory support that was used. This was a temporary VAD, post-cardiotomy. How did, which patients did best with this? Uh, were, these were patients that picked three of these. Uh, three high-dose inotropes. You can see here mortality was 80%. Distinctly, this is what they used as the criteria for implementation of BVS in this, in this series. So I think if those are the types of people. When you are starting your second or third onotrope, you're on a bunch of vasoconstrictor, the EF is lousy, your lactate is rising, your CVP is up, those are the people to consider mechanical circulatory support on. Your exit strategy is very important to consider when you start temporary mechanical circulatory support. The ideas are one of three, that you're going to bridge to recovery that you're going to bri bridge some type of definitive intervention, or you're going to bridge to what we call decision, which is I'm not sure which of these two we're going to do, but we're going to do one of them. This is the bridge you don't want to get on, okay? which is the bridge to nowhere. All right, And I see this not uncommonly, where we have patients that are poor candidates that end up getting put on this type of support. So what are the indications for this? Cardiogenic shock, that's not necessarily a low flow state from what you and I would think. Septic Septic patients that have eight liters of cardiac output that continue to have 
profound lactic acidosis uh, and profound hypotension that need maybe 10 or 12 liters of cardiac output may be considered in this situation. Those patients where you think you're going to recover them, they're going to revascularize them in some way. They have myocarditis that you expect to get better. They were on pump in the OR and they aren't getting better for some reason because of bad pleasure or something like that. Um, those are good people to consider. You're good, this is a great transplant candidate. These are good people to consider putting on or people that you think we're going to get a VAD or are good candidates for a VAD. Those are good people to put on. Who are lousy candidates to put on I think is a better question. When you start seeing things like this, you need to say where are we going? Are we getting on the bridge to nowhere? So patients over the, older than 70, I think you need to seriously start thinking about what bridge are you getting on? Um, and particularly, I would start thinking about where is this person currently in life? Do they currently have uh, other significant comorbidities or are they a vibrant 70-year-old running around doing exciting things, um, living there, going through retirement? Patients that have a less than two-year life expectancy, this is probably a bad idea, okay, that may be time to have a circle of life discussion with people. Uh, patients that have other bad ARDS, if they have that and you're now considering ECMO for some reason, I would say if you've been on the vent for more than seven days, bad idea. And then it's just difficult to support a lot of patients with BMIs greater than 40. Um, uh, particularly larger, taller individuals that have BMIs greater than 40. Uh, if you have someone that is an unrecoverable heart for whatever reason, this is their fifth MI and they've been turned down for transplant or bad in the past, this is not a good solution. Uh, patients that have had prolonged CPR, uh, that questionable quality of that CPR I think is a good question. And then taking into account other conditions that the patients may have, it's very important to consider what you're doing in that situation. If you have someone with, that has diabetes and has renal transplant and retinopathy, um, is this really someone that you're going to talk a cardiac surgeon to putting a VAD into? Because I can tell you they aren't going to get a, uh, a heart transplant. So other things, all these devices require uh, anticoagulation. Um, this does not mean HIT, but is there a contraindication to anticoagulation, recurrent GI bleeds, recent head bleeds, something along those lines, immunosuppressed patients for some reason. Uh, patients that have pre-existing liver failure or they have severe or moderate pulmonary hypertension because these are left-sided support devices for the most part and they're very, does not help your right side, although there are some percutaneous right-sided devices. But if this is irreversible, getting people off of this technology is very, very hard. Last but not least, almost all of these, pro all of these technologies require people to get transfused. Complications, I want you to pay attention to one line here. This is not benign technology right here. Uh, lower limb ischemia, essentially 11% rate requiring fasciotomies in 7% of cases, amputations in about 3% of cases, significant bleeding, strokes, so other neurologic issues, the need for dialysis um, is extraordinarily high. Okay, so this requires really high tech critical care and immense amount of resources to be put into patients. They're going to get sicker before they get better, and I think it's important for patients and families to know that. This is a slide that goes over, that I usually go over in terms of ECMO versus other forms of mechanical circulatory support. The biggest thing here, I'll make this brief, is oxygenation, or really high flow support that's required. ECMO is the best thing. If you want to something that is simple, that supports the LV, it's better to go with other forms of uh, support. And I would say that this, the other forms of mechanical surgery support are the things that should be used much more frequently than this. What should you expect from outcomes? Um, well, this is what I tell patients. Your loved one is probably going to die, okay? Um, and the data supports that, all right? Survival to discharge, 36%, all right? This is a number that has remained pretty constant since the year 2000 when the first sort of sets of data were published. This series of 202 patient survival essentially 38%, 30-day survival. But what I'll point out to you is this is what it looks like. Massive loss of life in the first 30 days, but once they hit 30 days, if you get to 30 days after you've got mechanical circulatory support, this is what it looks like. People live, on average, a long time. So I think it's worthwhile making the investment in this technology and moving people onto it with the understanding that they may not make it for the first 30 days. In fact, if I were a betting person, I would bet against that but if they do live, they usually live a long time. Um, now, this is the data from the ELSO database. I point out this, 40% survival to discharge. 
Um, and I think that's about an accurate number to present patients if you're considering mechanical circulatory support. Now, what I would say is if you have someone with severe cardiogenic shock that you're putting on, putting on an IVP in your, in your ICU right now and talking to your cardiologists, most of the time, I would say, most people would say that patient has probably a lower survival rate than 40 percent. But I'm not quite sure that that is how much better this is with or without the technology. I think we need additional data to say how much better we are. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for um, the time this morning. And uh, I think, uh, Micah, do we have time for questions or do we want to end the session? <laughs>